Hello everyone, this is Joe Armstrong and uh, I just opened up the lines here. We're going to start in a minute. Um, so uh, a lot of people joining right now. So hang tight. Okay, I'll um, slow down a little bit. So uh, we're getting after the hour here, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, welcome everyone. I'm Joe Armstrong. This is the new Power Systems, uh, renamed from AXFUG, New Power Systems Virtual User Group Webinar for February. A um, few announcements before we get started today. First of all, um, Think 2018 coming up March 19th to the 22nd. Um, just wanted to let you all know about, about that. Uh, IBM's big conference this year. Um, I will be there, so if you're there, and uh, give me a shout out, uh, you can try and contact me, let me hear, we can hook up somewhere if you like. Um, other conference, Tech U. Um, my favorite conference is Tech U. Is, um, the first one, there's two of them this year. The first one is April 30th to May 4th, not that far off if you wanna start getting approvals to, to go to Tech U. Um, I think that's the, the best conference that we put on for the technical people for IBM. That's in Orlando. Um, April 30th to May 4th. So um, start thinking about that. Uh, you'll find on the Power Systems Virtual User Group Wiki site, I have a discount code for TechU. I couldn't get a discount code for Think. Um, they weren't giving any out, but I do have one for TechU. So uh, you'll get a pretty good price, uh, uh, a better price if you use that discount code there. So use it. Um, next thing is, uh, if you've been looking at the wiki before and, and trying to get to replays, you'll notice that uh, the YouTube channel that I had was deleted sometime last year, last summer sometime. Uh, somebody decided that it shouldn't be there and they deleted it. Well, uh, we finally have permission to put up another YouTube channel. So it isn't quite there yet, but I'm working on getting the YouTube channel up there. Um, when I do uh, the replays and stuff, will all be up on YouTube again, um, or at least the last several. And I won't be able to move all of them, I don't think, but I'll, I'll put the last several up. So we'll get the YouTube channel up again. So you can look for that on the wiki as well. Um, next month's bug is gonna change a little bit. The uh, presenter I have lined up uh, is actually in Australia. So he's gonna be doing it in the middle of the night and uh, through various things, he can't do it in, uh, um, at the end of the month. So we're gonna move it up to March 15th. So look for uh, a March 15th invite for the next one. It's gonna be on AIX pretty AIX specific, it's gonna be uh, um, updating AIX, uh, minimal downtime I think is gonna be our topic, so um, look for that. Today's presentation is posted out on the wiki, so you should be able to download that now, uh, and it's uh, talking about Power9 scale out servers today. So this month we, we announced several new servers for Power9, and that's what we'll be covering. Uh, I have started the recording, so we are recording this session now. A uh, little introduction, uh, you know, if you've been listening to these webinars, you know, I'm Joe Armstrong. I'm a power CTS, a customer um, technical specialist. So I work in actually in the sales um, division. I support the, the sales specialists um, on the technical side. And um, I actually live in Rochester, Minnesota. And right now I'm in um, Oregon, been to Oregon today. I uh, have been for the last couple of months. And so uh, that's me. We also have on the line today um, three other people that are helping me out. Um, Tom Prokop, he's a CTS as well. Um, he's, he's presented here on the, uh, on the Power Systems Bugs before. 
Um, we have Nigel Griffith. Um, probably most of you know Nigel. He's presented for us as well. Uh, big name, Mr. Enmon. And um, also have Mickey Sparks. Mickey is an IBM I specialist. And when we get to the, some of the IBM I stuff, uh, Mickey's going to help me out with the uh, presentations there. So these guys are all going to be in the back um, answering questions. And they might even chime in a, a time or two uh, to correct me when I get things wrong, probably. So with that, let's get started on today's presentation. Um, you'll see it just on the front page here, we have the uh, model numbers for the six systems that we're gonna talk about. And I wanna give credit to um, these people listed below here, um, Ron Royal, Simon Forstendorfer, um, Ruby Zagbe, Michael Fisher, and Nigel Griffiths. Um, basically, I um, stole most of these charts from their presentations. Uh, listening to their presentations, most of my knowledge, a lot of reading and, and questions and answers back to these guys. So uh, a lot of credit goes to them. Uh, we all get our information from someplace, and uh, most of mine have come from this group as well as, as, well as others. Um, and you'll see some pictures I have in there from Gareth Coates as well. So let's uh, go down to the next page here. We're going to start a little bit slow and easing into this. And we're talking about Power 9 here. This just shows the uh, Power 9 roadmap. So I kind of ease into this, get everybody's brain going this morning. Um, you'll notice uh, I'm just going to back up a little bit. We had Power 8. We'll do some comparisons to Power 8 today. Um, when we got the, the next version of Power 8, we added NVLink to the chip. Um, in Power 9, NVLink is in all the Power 9 chips. So uh, we'll see that helps with some of the um, communications. Power 10 is well underway, I'll let you know. Um, there have already been meetings, and I've talked to some of the guys that are um, well in the, in the business of developing Power 10 and designing that now. So, um, you know, we, we've got the next version of Power coming out already, and we're, and we're just releasing this. You've all seen the Power 9 processor um, over a year ago. Uh, just Sukli presented this to us and talked about all this stuff, so I'm not going to go over it all. But I just want to take you a look at this because we're going to talk a little bit about the processor. We have some changes in Power 9. You'll see here that we have 24 cores on this power processor. Um, we actually do a couple of different processor core versions of it, uh, as this chip show, or as this chart shows. So we have the uh, split core, what we call the split core version, where you can get all 24 cores and and only use SMT4. So um, four threads um, per core on this version. And then we have the fused core version where we have, or the big core version, where we have the 12 cores. And we're gonna show a little bit more about how this works. But all the, all the systems we're gonna talk about today only fall into this 12 core version, okay? This is the scale out power VM ecosystem ones. If you listened to our December version where we announced Power 9, the very first Power 9 system, it used split cores because it was a Linux um, system, it was a high performance computing Linux system. So it used the split cores, but today we're all, all big cores um, today are fused cores. So here's a, a Power 8 core. The Power 9 core looks a little bit different. You can see we have these super slices. It's made up of slices of cores. Uh, a super slice has two of these exact slices. We go down to the slice, every super slice, um, and this is a little bit important for some of the next charts that we're going to show as um, some of the units, um, the processor units on it, like the vector scale unit and, and such. So we'll see that now in this next chart. But so when we look at a core, a Power 9 core, this is what we're seeing now in this big core, okay? So this is the full core, the big core that we're going to see. As you can see, it has four of these slices, four super slices will be made up of eight of these little slices here, okay? So this is a slim core, and I only put this up here, not, not because it's what's going to be in the systems today, but this is what uh, the slim core, or the, the half core, if you will, smaller cores. Um, each super slice has two of these slices, and every slice has a logical store unit, uh, an ALU arithmetic logic unit, and a vector scale unit. And the, the key point here is that for every core here, there's four threads, so this is, can run SMT4. Every thread gets its own little slice to run in, which makes the threads very efficient to go through there. If we look at the next one, here's a full core, what we're gonna see in the systems today. 
and they have eight of these slices and they can run up to SMT8. So every thread, again, gets its own slice and its own units to work in. Again, making the threads um, very um, efficient. So how can we do this? I mean, we didn't do this in Power 8, we didn't do this in Power 7. How can we do this in Power 9 now? And all, this is how we can do it in Power 9. Eight billion transistors in Power 9 chip. So kind of this shows the, the different power chips as we go through here and, and the number of transistors in each one and power nine, eight billion transistors. And with eight billion transistors, you have a little bit more that you can do with them. And so we've used that to, to make the chip more efficient and that's how we're getting the, the performance out of this chip. This chart shows just the, the technology. So this is the, the nanometer technology that's used for the different chips and how it's shrunk. And this kind of shows how we can get to eight billion transistors on the chip because we're using 14 nanometer in power nine, power eight was 22. So this is pretty typical of the industry. It's kind of shipped down. And, and I think um, most of the chips today, I think the Intel chips are also using uh, 14, if I remember right. So this isn't, you know, like unique to power. So there's a lot of uniqueness in the power chips. Um, the actual technology that we use for getting there isn't necessarily unique. One thing that's different, another thing that's different from Power 9 to um, than the scale out chips from Power 8 is that we are not using a dual chip module. In Power 8 on the scale out systems, we did what we called a dual chip module. Um, everything kind of looked like a, a single, it's a single socket, uh, two chips kind of plugged into the same socket and six cores on each chip. What that meant though is that there's really two chips here and there's communications between these two chips. In Power 9, all the Power 9 chips are single chip modules. Um, and so all the cores are on here. So between 12 um, cores for the big cores and 20 cores if you do the split cores. Theoretically, you could do 24 split cores, right? Because we have 12 cores here to split. Um, as we see, if, well, at least so far in our um, split core version that we announced in December, it only goes up to 20. So we, we didn't use all 12 in there. Um, so max number of cores on a chip is 12 for the big cores, and right now it's 20. I'm not sure if we'll ever see 24 split cores. We'll have to wait in the future and see what um, else comes out. So <clears throat> we have um, different memory in the, uh, in the Power 9 now. In Power 8, um, everything was this buffered memory, uh, and so IBM's unique um, memory. And uh, in Power 9, the scale up or the enterprise versions of the systems will still use um, buffered memory, but the scale out, what we're talking about today, will all be um, direct attached um, regular industry memory, all right? So um, a couple of things with that. One is that uh, the bandwidth is a little bit lower um, on this memory, um, but it, the, the trade-off is it's much cheaper. And that's really why we went to it, is for these scale-out systems to bring the price down and make them more competitive, com competitive all right? Uh, this is really good, actually, going to DDR4. We had DDR4 in the later models of, of Power 8 when we came out with the C models. We cut power, um, DDR4 and Power um, 9 now. Um, it's, it's great because that's where the, the future is going with these. And um, uh, what, what we'll see here is by going with DDR4 and, and they've made a little bit more room in the Power 9, we actually get um, and larger chips. We're going to have double the memory um, capacity on the new systems. Um, we'll go up to uh, 128 gig, gigabyte DIMMs on this, as we'll see, and, uh, and, and we'll have twice what we had before. Uh, one thing about using this commodity um, industry standard memory, though, is that uh, uh, while it's industry standard, if you're not buying it from IBM, if you don't get the IBM DIMMs ordered with your systems, uh, it will not be supported. So when you order systems, don't think that, oh, you're going to buy this other memory on the market somewhere else and plug it into your system. Um, maybe it'll work, but it won't be supported, and, uh, and you won't want to do that. So don't, don't, don't be doing that. 
So Power 9, also another new thing, uh, is PCIe Gen 4. Again, uh, Gen 4 is just coming out. Uh, we, don't, we won't actually see um, when we go through the PCI adapters uh, that we have Gen 4 adapters today. They're still, still coming, but the great thing is that it's built into um, the processor chip. So we're all ready for PCIe Gen 4 today. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see as right now, mostly most of our adapters will still be Gen 2 and uh, Gen 3. But Gen 4 does double the bandwidth. So we get uh, a much higher, much um, higher bandwidth capacity on Power 9, and um, it is built into the uh, we we did in Power 8. We built the PCIe um, into the processor chip. Uh, we still have PCIe built into the processor chip on Power 9. Um, really makes it more efficient for us uh, and uh, better bandwidth. Now, um, while I said that most adapters are Gen 3. Um, so the Gen 3 adapters will plug into the Gen 4 ports. They'll, they'll run just fine in Gen 4 ports, um, and uh, so there are no problems there. This particular chart I put in, it's, it's really for, um, for the future. Uh, it's for open CAPI and uh, multi-node support, uh, both things that we don't really have right now in these systems. So it, it's all coming. Uh, it's basically. Uh, just saying, though, that we were prepared for that. We've got uh, 25 gigabytes per second optical bandwidth. Um, the high speed um, for when we get to the scale-up versions where we have multiple nodes, when we start doing open CAPI uh, for those things, or we're um, doing GPUs and such, um, this, is all, this all makes sense. For the systems that we're going to talk about today, um, this really doesn't apply. But I did want you to know about it, because um, it's all future stuff uh, that, that you'll be seeing uh, Later on in the year, the uh, workload optimized um, frequency is uh, something that we're making a big deal of, or it's been kind of made up a big deal of, but it's not really new in um, in Power Nine, except that we're going up to ultra mode now, and it's been a little bit confusing. So let me see if I can explain this right. We basically have four. Um, frequencies, numbers that you might know, that you might want to know about. One is a minimum frequency, um, then there's a nominal frequency, and then we have this turbo and this ultra. So minimum frequency is what you get if you run in power saver mode. So we've got really, uh, it says four modes, but um, the first mode here is disable all modes. So this little chart down here is what you see if you go to ASMI to um, change the mode on your system. And the first one is disable all modes. If you disable all modes, you're running in nominal. If you're running in nominal mode, you're running at the nominal frequency and it doesn't change. So you're running at a static frequency unless you have um, idle power saver mode on. And then if it's not doing anything, it will drop down to um, idle power saver frequencies, right? But otherwise you're running there. If you run in, in this power saver mode, then you're gonna run at the minimum mode or the minimum frequency, all right? So you'll run at this minimum frequency down here. And that's, you know, if you might set it to that if you're gonna be gone for a weekend and you know it's gonna be light workload over the weekend or a holiday and you wanna save um, energy, um, you might put it down to that mode. Um, by the way, you can change the modes and it does not take a reboot. So you can change the modes um, without a reboot um, anytime on the system. Now, the um, the Nominal or the dynamic performance mode, it's not really called nominal dynamic performance mode, it's called dynamic performance mode, um, will enable the processor to run above up to turbo to turbo frequencies. The, what gets it there is if it's, if it's not hot and um, it will run at a higher frequency. What I've been told is that most, most data centers run at a temperature that it's almost always gonna get up to turbo frequency. That it's just not a problem for it to get up there unless your data center is, is too hot or maybe the air is too thin and it's not getting enough cooling or, or something like that. But it will always run up there, up, run up to turbo. It's almost guaranteed to run up to turbo, um, though we don't actually make any guarantees um, to that. So, um, and if, if, so if it's, if it's running a very light workload, so if some cores are disabled, and only some cores are being used, it can actually go above turbo in this particular mode. 
it's really hampered by um, the thermal and the uh, energy draw. In, in a socket, we only allow it to draw 160 watts in this case. And so with that, it, it pretty much mostly tops out at thermal unless some of the cores are disabled and then it can go above that. All right, so the maximum uh, performance mode gets you above turbo all the way to what we call ultra now. So this is the very maximum frequency that you'll be able to run at. So if you set it at, at maximum, you can get it up there. What'll happen if you set it to this is that we'll use extra energy to spin the fans faster to get better cooling, and we'll allow the socket to go all the way up to its maximum, which is 250 watts. So the voltage regulators that we have are spec'd at 250 watts. So in maximum performance mode, we'll just use everything we can to get the best, highest frequency possible, and it will go all the way up to um, ultra. Um, mostly limited, uh, again, uh, mostly limited by the socket power draw, as I understand it. Um, the thermal will certainly limit it, but most data centers that are running cool enough, um, usually it's the socket power draw that, that limits it, is uh, what my friend and power guru, Todd Rosedahl, tells me. Uh, so if you have the idle power saver, setting on, it will drop down um, when, when nothing is happening, it will drop down, everything will drop down to this minimum power saver um, frequency. So if you have idle power saver on, it will do that. What happened in power eight is that we basically defaulted to disable all modes. We defaulted and, and just ran nominal, all right? In power nine, um, we default to either the dynamic performance mode or the maximum performance mode. So when we go through the charts of each system, um, it shows what we're, gonna, what we're gonna default to. Most of the time, it's maximum performance mode. We want you to get the max out of it now. Um, and so we're gonna default to that. I think uh, there's one system that we, that we default to dynamic performance mode. So that is the, uh, the power. So again, nothing really new here, but um, except we're changing the default and you, you should probably understand what that does. So, um, since we're changing it, you might hear the fans go up faster if there's a heavy workload on this. Um, you might hear the fans spin up faster um, to get better cooling. All right, so the other new thing uh, with <coughs> Power9 is NVMe support uh, built in on the, um, in the SAS adapters. So uh, the uh, Power9 systems have you know, for the back plane, for the drives that fit in the back plane, we have internal SAS adapters. In those slots, we can plug in these NVMe cards instead, all right? So each NVMe card uh, is, a, is a carrier, and it carries two NVMe drives, 400 gigabyte drives, right? And they plug in, as I said, to this SAS controller back here. Um, you can mix an NVMe card and a SAS controller. So if there's two slots, you can put an NVMe card in one slot, you can put a SAS controller in the other slot, um, and they are not socket dependent, meaning that if you only have one socket um, uh, populated in the system, you still have both uh, slots, both uh, NVMe or SAS adapter slots available to you, all right? So since there's two slots and there's two drives per card, that means there's a maximum of four of these NVMe drives. Right, and these are uh, a little bit better performance than, than what you would get with a uh, DASD, of course, with, with spinning drives. A little bit better performance, I understand it, that would you get from SSD drives. The difference is that if you're using these instead of drives, there's no concurrent maintenance on the NVMe um, thing. So, you know, you have concurrent maintenance on your drives, not the SAS adapters that are in, internal, but you do have concurrent maintenance on the drives. And if you're using these as drives, it's not, they're not concurrently maintained. Also, these have a write endurance of one drive write per day. So a drive write per day means that uh, you can take the capacity of whatever the drive is, and you can write that capacity to it every day for whatever its warranty is. So if its warranty is a year, you can write, rewrite that capacity to that drive every day for a year, and, and it should be just fine. Um, these are 400 gigabyte drives on here, so you can write 400 gigabytes to them every day for their warranty. Um, we don't really, uh, so Tracy Smith was telling me, we're not really suggesting that you use these drives as data drives. These are really should be used as boot drives, all right? They're intended primarily for booting an OS. Um, you can boot these with AIX, the iOS, or Linux images, 
um, IBM I is not does not support um, NVMe, so you cannot boot IBM I directly from this. Um, you can um, give these to the VIO um, partition and then virtualize them. So you could do that, and then you could boot IBM I from them in that way if you want. Uh, each drive is separate. I wanted to say that each drive is separate, meaning that there's four drives, and and every drive can be given to a different partition. So even though there's two drives on one card that plugs into a slot, if you start thinking about it by PCIe cards, you think, oh, then that one card has to go to a partition, but that's not right. Um, every drive uh, can be given to its own partition. So you got four separate drives uh, that can be given to four separate partitions on here. Uh, and this, this picture over here, I guess this is a quarter. And just to give you kind of a size, here's uh, NVMe card here, and this is a quarter to give you an idea of how big it is, not very big. All right, another thing, we're getting close to the end of all this. We're going to get to the systems pretty soon, everybody. So um, the next thing, Power9 does not have internal DVD support, all right? So DVDs are getting old. Uh, they're slower than what we have today. Uh, you have this the system, kind of like you know a drive system, you have this system that's got this laser inside, moving parts and all of that, so um, your RAS isn't as good on it. Um, we're replacing them with USB memory keys um, much faster. You can see uh, 20 megabytes per second on a DVD versus 90 on the USB. Uh, it's easier, it's smaller, it plugs in right into the front, no moving parts, it's just what we're going to now. If you want a DVD, you can still add one um, it has to be an external DVD. We do not support anything in the system now. Um, external DVD, and it would plug into one of the USB slots on the system. So you can still get uh, a DVD. Um, AIX, VIOS, um, uh, and I think IBM I, and Linux all support. You can download um, onto a memory stick and on the USB flash stick, and then you can stick that in, and you can still boot from that just like you would uh, if you had it on a DVD. So you're not really losing anything here, we're just, not, we're just going away from DVDs. Um, seems everybody nowadays downloads anyway. I, I hardly see anybody actually orders DVDs. Uh, most people are downloading. Uh, it's just much easier, um, efficient, and get the latest thing that way. Uh, and also, if you're using this, uh, I guess the recommended size for a USB stick is uh, 16 gigabytes uh, at least to use 16 gigabyte uh, USBs. I mean, now you can get them, you know, 100 gigabytes. So uh, lots, uh, and, and they're not very expensive. So you can go out and get one of these. So let's start talking about the servers now. Um, but again, just before we get there, um, here's some key dates. All right. So we announced. Power9, you can't see servers on, on the 13th of February. Um, here's, I put a little slice in this chart. Here's uh, what we're doing today. Uh, we don't really have, I would say, real performance numbers to share today. <laughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, um, our perf numbers, CDW numbers, the things that we're used to seeing so that we can make comparisons are not available yet. They'll be available on the 27th, so the end of the month. Uh, when I do get them, I will take a uh, sheet um, and post that on the wiki um, with the other stuff for this webinar. So you can look for it there if you like. But uh, I think what basically it slowed down because the whole meltdown specter thing and firmware changes and stuff, we had to update firmware and that just put um, everybody back to testing and, and doing some of their testing again. So uh, performance numbers later this month. So we announced on 2.13, but the real launch is on 3.19. And why 3.19? Gosh, well, that's because that's Think 2018, IBM's one huge um, event of the year. And so the executives want to get up. They want to sound smart to talk about cool IBM stuff. So we did this quiet little announce. And now we're going to do the real fireworks at Think 2018. Um, so I just put it off a little bit. So the systems that we're, GA, uh, that we're announcing today will GA the end of March. So March 20th is when the, the systems will actually uh, GA. So um, we can order them today, uh, assuming all the tools are set up right. 
Uh, it should be able to order things today, but we can't uh, we can't ship anything. We won't actually have them available until the 20th. So one more chart, I think, uh, before we get there. And this is about um, since I told you I couldn't give you our first numbers, um, I did think did think that I would throw this chart in just to kind of show you that uh, the performance that I'm hoping that we can expect. Um, this is a chart from uh, when Jeff Stukely pitched the Power 9 chips uh, a little over a year ago to us. Actually, I think it was almost a year and a half ago that, that hot chips that they were talked about. So these numbers are all what they get from uh, their uh, simulations and theoretical computations when they actually do the hardware. Um, so this is 40 to 60 percent performance boost. Actually saw a demonstration that Nigel did um, running a program that he has on Power 8 and then running it on Power 9, and it kind of fits into this. So you know, it's a good it's a good signal that maybe uh, this is this is right on. So I think uh, we'll see a nice performance boost. Uh, we can expect that, and when we get the numbers, we'll share them. Oh gosh, well it's a power system anyway, so we're getting closer guys. So this is the AC92. I just wanted to throw this in because this was the first Power9 that we announced. This is a, a high performance computing system and I think I have one other chart that kind of just shows the, the benefits of this, but this is uh, um, has up to 20 cores. You can see here that's where they were, we're doing the split. So up to actually 40 cores, 20 per socket, up to 40 P9 processor cores because it's a, a two socket system. But it's filled with GPUs. Um, up to four GPUs, and uh, this was the first Power9 system we announced. Really kind of benefits from that in this whole NVLink thing. So most um, Intel systems that are out there, actually every Intel system that's out there that has GPUs, talks to the GPU from the CPU with a PCI connector, all right? And maybe they use um, uh, whatever PCI system they have in there, if it's PCI3 or whatever, but they're getting about 32 gigabytes per second for this link. Well, in Power 8, we had NVLink, when we built into our later Power 8 system, 80 gigabytes per second, which gave us a real boost in performance. When we went to Power 9, here's our Power 8 chip. When we went to Power 9, we went to NVLink 2.0, which is 150 gigabytes per second. I have to tell you that every Intel system out there is still using PCIe, and so we're way faster than them talking from the CPU to the GPUs. And the GPUs all use NVLink between them anyway. All right, but this allows to get the data down to the GPUs and back and forth much faster. It allows us to use what we call large modeling um, between uh, in our in our high performance computing. So a real benefit to Power Nine. So finally, our Power Nine scale out family for February of 2018. So we're going to talk about six different systems today. All right, the um, Let's see, I'll just kind of start here. We have tips in different families. First, first thing I have to say is whoever did the naming convention in Power 8, um, I hope they got a big bonus because the numbers made sense and they kept it for Power 9. So we'll, we'll say the 9, of course, the, the first 9 means it's Power 9. That, that's great. The second one is how many sockets um, are in the system. And the, the last number is um, the height of the system in, in use. So there's a 2U system or a 4U system. Okay. And then we have these letters on the front. So we also have the S's in Power 8 for scale out systems. And then we had E's for our enterprise systems. Um, I haven't seen the enterprise naming yet, but I expect to see an E. Um, and then for the Linux only system, we threw an L on the end. Uh, for Power 9, we put an L in the front this time. So it's an L922. That means it's a Linux only system. And then we have a new one. We have these H's in the front, and what does H stand for? I thought maybe it stood for happy, and we, we sent a little something extra with these systems to make you happy. Um, maybe I've been in Oregon too long, and the H is actually for HANA, SAP HANA. So these are HANA only, or HANA Solution Editions, I should say, uh, HANA Solution Editions. So um, really, we're gonna, when we look at these, we're gonna see exact same hardware. So this H922, exact same hardware as the S922, the H924, exact same hardware. The S924, a couple of different things. You can only run, and this is this is actually a sweet thing, um, you run AIX and IBMI up to 25% of the cores. So usually, or in our Power 8 editions, they were HANA only, we ran Linux only on them, 
Um, and if, if your HANA um, workload did not use all the cores, those other cores were sitting there and, and couldn't really be used, all right? Um, except for other Linux workloads. You could put other Linux workloads on there, but a lot of people wanted to put AIX or IBMI on them, and they couldn't. Well, these systems were going to allow up to 25% of the cores. Oh, get out of there. 25% of the cores to be used with um, AIX or IBM I, all right? And then otherwise, um, they're running Linux and they're running Power VM, all right? So, so HANA runs on um, SUSE or Red Hat, and that's what the, they're really meant for. Now, I have to tell you, I, I did a, um, an e-config of uh, an H924 and an S924, and I got uh, pretty much the same thing. So uh, that's the, why we put H's on there. Um, so I looked into that and I was told that why we did that is one, we wanna separate it. We wanna be able to bundle these, we wanna be able to give larger discounts on these. Uh, we wanna track who's using HANA, so, um, or, or what, what systems are being used for HANA. So that's why we have a whole HANA thing. Uh, it allows us to, to really do more with um, our HANA systems. So that's why, but um, otherwise they're, they're pretty much the same. So let's start uh, with the S and the H924, looking at it from a hardware um, visit. First of all, um, again, this is the uh, big core or fused core system, right? It's a 4U server, fits in a regular 19 inch rack, um, and uh, it comes in an eight core, a 10 core, or a 12 core um, version. So you have three different um, processor types to choose from. Uh, both processor uh, that you put if you get a two socket system, both of them have to be the same. That's always been the case um, for us. Up to four terabytes of, of memory. Again, this is industry standard um, DDR4 DIMMs. So up to four terabytes would be twice what the um, 8924 or the 824 um, was. And um, this little thing up here, up to 266 megahertz, we're going to see a little bit more about the memory, so I won't pay too much attention to that right now comes with 11 PCIe slots. Uh, they're a mix of Gen 3 and Gen 4 PCIe slots. Um, four of them are um, CAPI enabled. There's five actual Gen 4 slots, uh, four of them CAPI enabled, and then we'll have six Gen 3 slots. And um, we'll look at how these are all split out uh, in a little bit. Um, four high-speed ports. This is a, that 25 gigabit ports that I showed you earlier. That's for open CAPI. Doesn't really apply um, yet. Two backplanes, and we usually give um, optional backplanes. Um, today we have two backplanes, um, a 12 bay backplane, so you put 12 drives in there, or an 18 um, drive backplane. So if you get the 12, you can also put an RDX um, media in there. So this bottom picture here shows um, 12 drives in there, and then this is the RDX uh, media that goes in the side. Um, again, no DVD in here, but you can use, put this RDX in. If you do the 18 bay backplane, then you replace this with these extra slots to go in there. So you get six more slots. All right. Um, then again, two internal storage controllers. Uh, you can do a spit, split backplane uh, by using both those controllers. Uh, you can also, again, use those, um, those controller slots for the internal NVMe, all right, flash boot uh, cards. And I was, I was told, that um, I haven't verified this, but I was told that if you use NVMe cards, it's actually cheaper than putting in SAS adapters and drives. And uh, I tried to get around to um, verifying that, but I haven't been able to, so maybe somebody knows that for sure. There is um, external expansion drawer support, both for storage drawers and PCIe drawers, and we'll, we'll see what, what that is in a little bit. And these systems support um, AIX, IBM I, and Linux. All right, and uh, as I mentioned, the, the HANA model, the H924 limits the AIX and the IBM I to 25% of the core activation. So you can only use 25% of the cores you have in there to run those operating systems. Here's a picture of it. Um, the front looks like this. Um, is your drive base here, fans um, down here, and then, um, Couple of things. They have an LCD display. We'll, we're going to see here. I'm going to show you an actual photo of that. Compliments of uh, Nigel and Gareth. Um, the F LCD is actually um, optional, although you, if you, when you have these in a rack, at least one system that's in that rack has to have an LCD display in it. 
and then the, the power is uh, way over here on the left side. So they kind of split that off there. Um, you have two sockets here. This is the processors with these huge um, heat sinks on top of them, and, and they're quite tall and they, uh, to dissipate that heat. And then memory um, kind of slips into either side of those. And then these two slots right here are the storage controllers, right? And then PCA slots back here. So um, let's look at an actual photo. Here's a, here's a photo of the front. Um, with the, uh, this is where the LCD um, panel will go at this particular server. Um, Nigel or Gareth said that uh, does not have an LCD on it because it was an uh, early ship. Um, there's the uh, power button over uh, out here. All right, the knobs out there. So uh, USB port here and then the six drives and, and fans below. Well, let's see. Uh, this is, has, has the cover off. Uh, the LCD plugs in here. You pull that off, LCD would plug in there. <coughs> This is the top of the system, and I, I just thought that was kind of nice because it shows uh, IBM has on the system all kinds of information about where things go, what the slot numbers are, and how the stuff is put together. Um, just, just pretty handy to have that there. So, you know, if your system comes in, if you happen to be there, you might want to flip a, a photo of this so that you have it handy for when you're trying to figure something out later. Um, looking inside, though, here's the actual inside with the cover off. Uh, they have this plastic um, perspex cover on here it's, uh, for airflow, all right? So this uh, kind of helps generate the airflow through all the components that, to do a better job of cooling on the system. So that's what's there. It's nice that it's clear. Um, you can see through it and see what dims are in it and everything. Um, but that's, that's what the actual inside of the system looks like. So here's um, a topology thing, and this kind of, I always love these diagrams that kind of help uh, explain how stuff is put together. Uh, they give you a better idea of why we have um, plugging rules, what uh, adapters should plug where and, and such. So you can see here's the two power nine chips. Um, there's eight uh, dim um, lines off of each chip. Uh, there's 16 dim slots per socket, so every, Every socket here has 16 dim slots, 32 dim slots total, right? And then we have the PCI Gen 4. Now, um, there's only, I said, five PCI Gen 4 slots on here. Um, the PCI Gen 3 goes through this switch and uh, breaks it up, so you get three and three here to, to get your total number of uh, PCI slots. And we also have off of this socket, so if we're gonna populate one socket, it's obviously this one, because then you get your USB and your storage controllers all come off of one socket. So that's why if you only have one socket in, you still get all this um, with it, right? So I want you to note here, um, these PCI slots that are Gen 4 by 16, right? That's what we can use to attach um, IO drawers. And uh, I'm just gonna pop down to this next picture here. Here's a PCI expansion drawer. And as you recall, it's got two fan out modules. Um, each fan out module holds six PCI adapters and plugs into an adapter on the back of your system, right? So when you, when you add one of these drawers, you have to plug into a PCI Gen 4 by 16 adapter slot, right? So if I pop back up there, we have three of those slots. That means we can plug in three fan out modules. So you can add two drawers, but only three fan out modules. All right, so we're gonna see, um, actually I think um, uh, in the chart after this, we're gonna look at, at the numbers, some numbers. So this is just as, if you have a single socket, pretty obvious, this is what you get, all right? So here's um, the PCI slots. And so if you have one socket populated, you only have one of those PCI Gen 4 and you can plug in one drawer with, with one fan out module. Okay, if you have both sockets and you get two drawers and you get three fan out modules, like I mentioned, so a total number of PCIe slots, um, 13 or 26. Okay, so this picture here is, is nice. It gives you a, a slot, you know, what, what slot number goes with which slot. Um, and uh, this uh, first C1 is the FSP in the system, the flexible service processor in the system, so you really start your PCI cards on C2, right? 
And then here's, here's the slots for the first socket and the slots for the second socket. Uh, the slots are all concurrently maintainable, so you can um, hot plug these uh, adapters, and they're full height, half length PCIe form factors um, on these systems. Uh, they are 924 and the H, yeah, the S or H924s. So a couple of processor things. As I mentioned, it's a single chip module um, design. There's three um, speeds, uh, eight core ten, or three sizes, an eight core, 10 core, or 12 core. If you want maximum um, computability in, in your system, you certainly want to use the 12 core option. If you want the fastest per core performance, um, then the eight core processor is a little bit faster. So typical frequency range. So these numbers, you know, I mentioned back when we talked about the whole power mode thing, that there's really four numbers, a minimum, a nominal, uh, a turbo, and an ultra, right? These numbers are turbo and ultra. We're not seeing the minimum or the nominal with these numbers, okay? This is the turbo and the ultra numbers um, here. And uh, I, I couldn't even tell you what the minimum or the nominal are um, at this point. You can take, uh, I guess it's probably somewhere down around three um, would be my guess for this. Um, but I'm trying to get that chart and um, it's just not available yet. So this, this is the numbers that we've got to us. Um, a single, you can use a single processor um, config uh, for eight and 10 core. We do not allow a, uh, not support a 12 core single processor. So um, single socket. So uh, if you're gonna use uh, 12 core, you, you have to have both sockets populated. So effectively you've got eight, 10, um, or 16, 20, or 24 core options, right? Uh, the frequency uh, mode is gonna be set to max performance mode by default. So this is, this is the highest one. This is one that's gonna give you the highest frequency you can get all the way up to ultra. Um, it's going to use as much power as it can to get there if there's a workload to drive it there, right? It's not going to be running there all, all the time, just, just spinning away. Um, it's only going to go up there if there's workload to drive it there. But it will use all the energy it can to get to give you the max performance possible, right? And, uh, and the uh, IBM IP group for the um, S924 is a P20. Uh, and I guess the last bullet here, the processor processor fabric interconnect. This is the same, it's uh, 16 gigabytes per second. Uh, very fast interconnect between the CPUs. So um, very, very fast. Um, faster than, than we've had before even. So memory for the uh, S24 924. Um, you know, the typical what I said, DDR4, low latency, up to 170 uh, gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. Um, you get that bandwidth if you populate um, uh, the sockets, um, not all the sockets, but all the sockets for every line. So half the sockets, if we populate half the sockets, you put all the DIMMs in there, and then you would have um, all the lines fully populated and you get your max bandwidth. Uh, there's 16 DIMM slots per socket, as I mentioned, 32 total, up to four terabytes. Um, the minimum configuration you can have, you have to have at least two 16 gig DIMMs. Uh, we plug these in pairs. So the first pair you would plug would be 216 gig, um, and that's the minimum supported uh, memory configuration. Uh, There's some plug rules. Um, actually, you know, I said we plug these in pairs up to eight. After you have eight plugs, then we plug them in quads. So if you can plug two, four, six, eight, then you go to 12 and then 16. Um, there's a, they run at a little bit different frequency depending on which DIMMs and what you have plugged in. So if you have, um, two to eight DIMMs per socket, all right? And you have 16 gig DIMMs, it'll run at this frequency. And, and so some of those other charts where I said kind of ignore that frequency, it's saying it will run up to 266. So if you're running 16 gig DIMMs and you, and you only have um, up to eight sockets pop or eight DIMMs um, populated in the socket, then you'll run at this frequency. If you go to the larger DIMMs, the frequency drops down a little bit. If you plug all the sockets, um, more than eight sockets, you go 10 to 16 sockets, or 10 to 16 um, slots um, per socket, then you'll run at this frequency. Now, there's not a huge difference between these frequencies, so I'm not sure um, how much you would actually see here, but the dims will run a little bit slower the more you put in them. 
Uh, as we'll see, that's going to be true for uh, for all the systems. So I do a little bit more explanation here, um, but we'll see uh, we'll see that kind of true for all of them. So we do support from 16 gig um, on the uh, 924s up to 128 um, gig gym. And uh, I tell you, uh, we'll start um, being more expensive. You get up to the larger dims. So the storage options, um, as I mentioned, you know, we have the in two slots for the, for the NVMe cards. Um, uh, this chart, this chart's kind of nice that it gives you the feature codes along the side here. Um, if you're uh, just a, uh, a customer buying one of these, you probably don't need to know the feature code. Uh, if you're an IBM -er or a business partner and you're configuring these, these feature codes are handy to know. Um, we can have the, the single um, 12 bay um, backplane. You can uh, do the split bay. So you add the, the split on it. It puts in the other um, SAS card and then uh, splits the backplane. We also offer um, dual write cache uh, SAS adapter card for that. and um, and dual right cache for the 18 bay, right? So that, and then uh, if you want to order the RDX docking station, then that's the feature code for that. Okay, and I kind of went over the the NVMe card. We have two drives per card. Um, here's a, there, we support all the the storage drawers. Uh, I don't think you can buy this uh, 5887 anymore, but it, it is supported to migrate there. All right, um, but the the drawers these drawers are supported. And then this is the um, media that's supported on there. Again, the NVMe cards, 400 gig. And then we have the spinning drives and um, SSDs. Um, one thing to note is that some of the SSDs are 10 drive writes per day. That's what this is, 10 drive writes per day. And, and I, I talked about what the drive writes per day meant. Um, and then these drive, these SSD sizes are one drive write per day. And then it doesn't say that up here, but the NVMe card is one drive write per day, right? And then we have um, two RDX disk cartridges available, uh, one terabyte and a two terabyte version. All right, so let's talk about the uh, next for you server. It's a 914 server. We had an S814 server as well. So it's very, very similar in that. Um, this is the only Power9 server that comes in a tower version. So all the Power9 servers fit into 19 inch rack. Uh, the S914 um, also comes as a tower. This is really uh, because a lot of IBM i customers uh, use these smaller servers, this particular smaller server, they don't need as many cores. Um, and they also don't have a data center. You know, it sits uh, in a closet somewhere typically, you know, in somebody's office or something. And so we offer a tower version of this. They are a um, little bit different here. With the um, 914, we don't have the um, 10 or 12 core option. We have a six, a eight, or a four core option. There's the difference. We, this uh, 914 comes as a four core. We do not offer a one core option on any of these servers. However, we do have always offered um, factory deconfiguration of cores. So you can actually turn the core off. You don't have to buy the software for the core. You still pay for the hardware, but you don't have to pay for any software for that particular core. And, and you can deconfigure the cores on these servers as well. Um, but at least we'll be a four core there. Um, the uh, 914 only goes up to one terabyte, right? If you use the four core version, it's 64 gig. So uh, for the four core version, it's up to 64 gig, but uh, then other versions up to um, one terabyte. The memory is the same. Um, and there's a fewer uh, PCI slots uh, on this. So there's um, eight of them on this particular server, uh, two Gen 4 and uh, six um, Gen 3 slots. Uh, again, uh, this is the same for the, the um, 924. One slot on all our systems is always reserved for an Ethernet adapter. And uh, that's uh, one, you need an Ethernet adapter in your system. It can be any Ethernet adapter, pick your favorite one. Um, but it's also used, I think, as it goes through manufacturing. It requires an Ethernet adapter to go through manufacturing. And so we always put an Ethernet adapter in. So there's one, one slot that's, that has to have an Ethernet adapter in it. All right. This particular system only has, uh, has two high-speed ports for the open CAPI acceleration, again, not used. It does support both backplanes, either the 12 or the 18. 
Um, it does still have both internal storage controller slots, so you can split that backplane. You can also put in the two NVMe cards, um, and it does come with the dual write cache support as well. And you can get it with the uh, RDX um, installed. You can see the RDX here in the tower or um, up here um, in the rack version. Um, an ID, uh, IO expansion drawer is only supported on the eight core and the six core version. So the four core version, again, has some limitations, um, 64 gig memory and um, no external, no IO expansion drawers, right? But the, the tower version does support 110. Um, it's the only system we have that supports 110, um, but yeah, the tower version does. Um, the S914, you can run um, AIX, IBM I, or Linux on this particular system. All right, so here's an internal uh, picture of, a, of the 914. You know, it's just very similar, it just doesn't have this, this um, socket populated. All right, um, so other than that, uh, very similar, not as many PCIe slots available, okay? So these, these are not being used. Um, it doesn't have that socket there, so it can't use those um, when we, and, but does have the power, uh, have the tower model there. Otherwise, very, very similar, uh, less blowers in it, doesn't need as, many, as much cooling, so there's fewer blowers in it. Um, and this is this exact same chart uh, as a single socket of the S924. So it's very similar in that respect, except that um, we took um, a couple of the slots off of this. Well, no, we didn't. No, we didn't. Oh, it's got the same slots on there. Uh, I'm picking a 922. So, um, so yeah, it's the same same picture as the uh, as the 924. Uh, some processor highlights is this. So um, pretty pretty much the same. I mean, only four, six, or eight cores. Otherwise, it's the same uh, single chip module. Again, these frequencies are the turbo and the ultra frequencies for um, these chips. Um, the IBM IP group is P10. If you do six or eight cores, if you do the four core option, then you get P05. So the um, least expensive of the IBM IP group, uh, less expensive uh, software OS license and, and such there. Um, otherwise, you'll notice that the frequency is the same. Um, whether you're doing four, six, or eight cores. So um, same, same frequency. Um, and the four core is minimum entry price. Um, that's the, the least expensive model. And then the eight core will, of course, give you the most um, computability, the most compute performance. Uh, the memory subsystem, so a little bit different. Uh, just a, a couple of things that are different on it. Uh, the four core feature, as I mentioned, is limited to 64 gigabytes. Um, otherwise, uh, it goes to a, a terabyte on, on the system. The, uh, the um, frequencies of the sockets are very similar, all right? So the, the same numbers. What we're missing here is there's no 128 gig DIMM supported on the S914. So just, just a couple of little changes as well. All right, so um, the storage options, again, the storage options are the same. Uh, we still have the NVMe cards. We have the, uh, the backplanes, um, the same backplanes. Um, the, the storage drawers uh, are the same. You, you can migrate the 5887. Um, you have no external storage option available with the four core option though, okay? You cannot put uh, external storage on the four core option. Um, and, and the disks are all the same as well. Uh, no IO expansion with the uh, with the four core option either. Uh, this just shows the PCI slots. Uh, again, since it's a single socket system, you'll get the C5 here through these over there um, on the system C6 through C12 uh, with C1 being FSP. Um, if you if in the six and the eight core options, you can attach one drawer um, with one fan out module. So you get a max of 13 PCIe slots on the six and the eight core. Um, you cannot attach a, a PCI expansion drawer on the four core model. Um, and just like all the others, the, uh, the uh, PCIe slots are concurrently maintainable. Um, it's full height, half, half length PCI form factor.
All right, so now we're going to shift a little bit from the um, four U um, systems to the two U systems. So we have the S922, the HANA system, the HANA version of it, the 922, and then the Linux version of the 922. They're all very, very similar. Um, there's a couple of differences that I'll, I'll point out as we go through. Um, just like all the others, there's a 19 inch rack enclosure. Uh, there's a 8, 12, 8, 10, and 12 core and a four core offerings on these. Um, depending on, on the different models, we'll go through that when we look at the actual processor for each one. Up to four terabytes of memory. So we can still put, even in this 2U system, we can put two sockets and we can put four terabytes. Now we talk about this uh, 12 core option here. Um, so we're gonna see how many cores we can really put in the full one. Um, we've, we've come down a little bit from 11 to nine PCIe slots. Um, we still have uh, five PCI Gen 4, but um, only four PCI Gen 3 slots. You'll see um, we, we, really for space cooling, we had to take out a couple and you'll see where we did that. Um, still we have the four high speed ports for the future stuff. Um, and then we have only one backplane option. Um, we don't have both backplanes. So in the, the 924s, we could do the eight or the 12 um, district bays. Um, we only have one, uh, it's an eight um, small fast form factor SAS bay option on this one. Still have the two internal controller slots, so you can still do a single or a split back pane, or you can put in uh, the internal NVMe flash boot adapters and boot from them, okay? Uh, supports IO expansion drawers, uh, and um, these also run um, AIX, IBM I, and Linux. Of course, um, the H22, again, limits your AIX and your IBM I to 24 core activations because the HANA system is meant for HANA, which is a Linux, um, database, so, so HANA is really a Linux system. The L922 is a Linux only, all right? And so this first GA, so in our Linux only systems before, um, you could run Linux in bare metal or under Power VM, or we had KVM, um, Red Hat VMs. So in our first GA, it's Power VM only, all right? So in the future, um, we'll, I expect we'll see bare metal KVMs have supported, but um, for this L922, um, the Linux is uh, under Power VM only. The uh, um, so here's a picture of the inside. So with with these uh, the heat sinks, these two sockets, the heat sinks a little bit shorter. You can get a little bit better view. Here's the dim slots, the storage controller slots here. So we have some dim slots on either side of it. There's some hiding behind that other storage controller too. They're kind of kind of go around both sides of the of the socket. The dim slots do. Um, we have six. So it, it has um, eight drive bays in the in the back plane, uh, and I, I mentioned. So six of them are up front here. Two of them are actually inside. Now all eight of them are concurrently maintainable. So you you can maintain both of them while the system is running. Um, obviously these ones that are inside are a little bit harder to get to, but they are concurrently maintainable. All all eight of them, right? So there's there's two of them on the inside. They're still the same number of um, memory slots, still 32 total, 16 per socket. And then um, you can see we've reduced the number of um, PCI slots that are actually in this system. So there's only nine of them, as I mentioned, inside here. If we look at the, uh, the system topology, um, looks very, very similar. In fact, this right hand looks exactly the same as the, uh, as the 924s. Um, on, on this side though, what we've done, since we had to reduce um, IO adapters, we took one of them off of each switch. So each of these switches instead of having three I, um, gen ad, uh, adapter slots come off of it, um, there's only two, right? So that's really the difference um, here. So it kind of gives you again an idea of if you're plugging in your high performance adapter cards, you want to plug them into these um, gen four slots, unless you have uh, something else plugged in them, but like if you have uh, IO expansion drawer, that's where you would plug these into. But if you have other um, high-speed adapters, you would plug them into these Gen 4 slots, right? And then, and then you want to divide up your slots um, accordingly so that, that you even things out between the chips and between the switches and, and everything to just get as even as possible spread, apart, spread across um, all the lanes uh, in, that you have available for your I.O. 
Um, I didn't mention that before, but the little purple boxes here, um, I thought maybe it was obvious, are the actual slot numbers for each of these. And then um, the, the other picture that I showed that has, one of the other pictures we'll see actually has all the slots um, in it, so you can match them up pretty easy. So these are the processor offerings. <clears throat> it's, um, again, very similar. Uh, this is for the S922 and the H922. So you'll notice, um, first of all, that there's no 12-core um, version of the S922 or the H922. Only the Linux, um, the L922 has the 12-core. These have the 4, 8, or the 10-core. Um, again, if you want maximum computability in your system, you get the 10-core options. Um, the 4-core option uh, gives you uh, the best price. Um, actually, the 8-core option, uh, if you see here, gives you the, the highest frequency range. And, and once again, this is the turbo frequency on this side and the ultra frequency on this side. Um, and, you know, I didn't mention it, the S9, um, actually, I wonder if I can back up to that. Uh, yeah, so, so this is the S9 um, 1.4 processor. Um, it's set to dynamic performance mode, okay? So there's, there's the uh, power saver mode, um, no modes where you're running nominal, and then there's a dynamic performance mode, which goes up to turbo, and the max performance mode, which goes up to ultra, which will use as much energy in the max performance mode. The 914 is the only system that defaults to dynamic performance mode. All the rest of them di um, default to the uh, max performance mode, which is, um, which is stated here. Um, we saw the 924, S924 was max performance mode. Um, the 922s are maximum performance mode as well. Okay, so um, we can have a single processor configs are supported, uh, so you can get single processor configs for all of these. Um, the four core is single socket only, uh, so you, you can't use four, two four cores to get an eight core, um, but so the, the four core is single socket only, and the, the four core does not uh, support an IO expansion, so this is very similar to the 914 if you're using the four core version, you can't. But um, you can run AIX or IBMI um, or Linux on this particular system, um, all of them, with the uh, exception that, of course, the H model is only 25%, um, as we keep seeing. And um, P10 group uh, for these. And you, you'll note here that even in the four core, um, uh, don't think this is an is a error, even in the four core in the 922, it's a P10 group. The four core on the uh, 914 was a P05 um, group. So on the Linux offering, we don't have the um, four core option. We have eight, 10, and 12. So here we can get all the way up to, to 12 cores. Um, the eight core, again, being the highest um, for the ultra frequency that we can get to. Um, but the, uh, the 10 and the 12 both go up to 3.8. Um, single processor config. So a lot like the 924, the single processor config for the 8 or the 10 core versions. But if you want the 12 core version, both sockets must be populated. Um, and then the, the mode for the 922 is also set to maximum performance mode. So as I mentioned, everything is maximum performance mode except the 914. So the memory is um, the same for all of them and, and really no difference here from, from what we've seen in the past. So um, we, we come back to getting a, a 128 gig DIMM. Um, on the 922s, so you can go up to four terabytes. I tell you, four terabytes and uh, and, and 20 cores in a 2U uh, with a nine power nine performance, you're getting a lot of power there in, in a little 2U box. So um, lots of power in this system. Otherwise, this is, is all very similar. Again, there's a minimum. You have to have at least two 16 gig DIMMs um, populated in the system and uh, a total of 32 DIMMs slots. 32 DIMM slots total um, if you have both sockets. Uh, the storage options uh, are a little different. Again, you still have both NVMe cards um, available to you, but again, only, only a single back plane and no um, big write cache um, adapters for this one, okay? Uh, the, there's, a, there's a little bit, uh, I, I don't know, not different, so both systems, the 922, the H922, 
and then the L922 all support the drawers. They're the same drawers. What's the difference here? The difference is the feature code. So if you're actually doing a configuration to order these and you're doing a 920, an L922, you have this different feature code to use, all right? So um, just so that you know that, uh, these all have an EF here and these are ELL. Not sure why they did that, um, but that's, that's the way it is. So um, same exact drawers, but a little bit different feature code um, to order them. And again, same media. Uh, same media sizes here supported as well, um, very similar. So um, you can pick from these. Um, note that these ones are the 10 drive rights per day, again, for, the, for this size media. And then um, the, the options. So here's, the again, the slot numbers. So you can match it up when you get your system. You can match up um, what slot it is, which ones are PCI Gen 4. Um, using this picture and, and pick out what you want. This again is the um, FSP card that the HMC plugs into. They have, we have a, a couple of serial ports on the back of all of our, a couple of USB ports on the back of every system and a USB port on the front. If you're putting in a PCIe expansion drawers, um, again, I'm, I'm gonna say uh, between the, the S922, the H922, and the L922, they're the same except for the feature codes. So again, if you're ordering these, um, use the right feature code for the one that you're ordering. Um, and it shows if you have uh, one slot, uh, one processor um, socket populated, then you get a max of 11 slots. If you have both slots populated, you can get up to 24, okay, and that's the same. You cannot use, again, you cannot use expansion drawers if you're using the four core option, okay? But all the PCIe slots, same before, are concurrently maintainable. These will be low profile, of course, it's only a two-use system. So these are low profile PCIe form factors. All right, so um, a little bit about the adapters um, for the um, Power9. So there's really two phases. We have GA1 um, here that, that we're just doing, and we'll have a GA2. So all the adapters are not going to be available um, today. Uh, kind of show you a list here. I'm not sure that it's how um, flexible or variable this list is going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. So just take it. Um, it may change. Let me put it that way. Um, before we start, there's uh, a couple of new adapters. There's two new PCI 3 network adapters. So we have a, a two-port 10 gig, uh, Nick and Rocky. So, and again, these are PCI 3. I don't think I, I asked. We don't have any PCI 4 adapters yet, but I think there's some in the works. And then there's a two-port 25 10 gig um, Nick and Rocky adapter. Both of these adapters are SRIOV capable. I think that's a big deal. Uh, I think we'll, we'll see more and more SRIOV usage. It's, it's a very cool uh, feature that we have, um, and uh, a lot of you know, with uh, a lot of flexibility with that. And then we have two new fiber channel, also PCI3 uh, Gen3 adapters. There's a 16 gig four port and a 32 gig two port fiber channel adapters. Um, these are using the Broadcom Emulets fiber channel controllers. Uh, and then these the the, the Ethernet and the network ones were using Mellanox. Okay. So here's a list, and it's kind of an eye chart. I'm not going to go through this. I just put this for your uh, to, to have it in the deck, so you can download this deck and have this list if you want. But here's a list of the uh, GA1 supported adapters. Um, that's the first page, and the second page um, goes through here, and it has um, some more of the GA1 uh, adapters. It's what you need to attach the drawers. Um, and such, so just wanted you to have this uh, as reference. And then here's some GA2 adapters. Um, also, just wanted you to have this as a reference. Um, also, it's kind of cool. Um, I don't know if it really as customers that you all hear these, but as, as IBMers and, and maybe as business partners, we hear these code names when we talk to people in the labs and, uh, uh, quite often. It's nice to have the code names here, so when they say something, we can put that with actual. We, we usually know these by either the name of the adapter or the feature code, um, and, and not so much by the code names. Um, here's, a, again, a 
GA2 uh, scale out supported adapters. All right, so we're going to get into the operating systems now and uh, talk about what's supported on these systems. Uh, I'm going to start with this because we really talk about compatibility modes. So this isn't, um, we talk about the power modes a little bit. Now we're going to talk about compatibility modes. And um, we have a, a P7 compatibility mode, a P8 compatibility mode, and then two P9 modes. And right now we've got the P9, we'll call it the base uh, compatibility mode. Um, the, the other P9 mode clear on the right side of here is um, we've got some, some more features that are coming out in the future. And so uh, we'll see a, another P9 mode um, in the future. So this is um, kind of going to get into, slowly get into the detail on here. This is the high level chart um, that shows what operating systems are really supported. Note the two glaring holes here, AIS 5.3. If you're still running AX53, upgrade, upgrade now, upgrade as fast as you can. Um, I think probably the only people who are still running it are people who have some kind of application that doesn't run on anything else, and they've, they've done every trick they could to put it in a WPAR and everything else. Well, on Power 9, you cannot run um, anything, uh, no 5.3 um, native stuff in, in Power 9. Uh, we allowed it a little bit in Power 8 um, for a short time, but we're not going to allow that in Power 9, so no 5.3 support there. Um, AX 6.1, 7.1, and 7.2. Um, same with IBM i 7.1, upgrade, upgrade now. Um, we're not supported in Power 9. And then we have the, the usual um, launch of Linux. So we have some, uh, I'm going to try getting Okay, so we had some muting going on there. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the Linux. Um, you can see no AIX 5.3 and Power 8. Uh, we did it uh, a little bit with the, this full I/O virtualization. We won't do that on Power 9. On Power 9, if you have WPARs already, uh, some that one version WPAR, and you're running 5.3 in that, you can migrate it. I don't think we offer that as an option any longer to to purchase. But if you're already running that. Um, Yes, you can migrate that to Power 9. Boy, just get off of it, really. Um, AX61 is supported in um, Power 9, but you have to run it in um, P7 compatibility mode. 7.1, the same thing, except you run it in P8 compatibility mode. And 7.2, the latest version, and we're going to look at in the detail in the versions, but the latest version, 7.2, runs um, natively in Power 9. So here's a little bit more detail, and just lots of numbers here. So uh, you know, I don't want to go through every one, uh, but except to say that there is a version of 7.2, the latest version um, that will run at Power 9 at, at GA um, VIOS. This is the version you need: um, 2.2.6.21 for the VIO server um, to run on Power 9. Um, we are making some changes. Uh, I understand they're due to come out on May 4th of this year to these older versions um, to make them Power 9 compatible. So, so you can look for that, right? And then we're also making some changes to these versions of the VIO server. Um, older versions of the VIO server will have updates that will also be able to run um, in Power 9. If you're running fully virtualized, and using LPM, you can um, run these versions of, of um, AIX 7271 or 6.1 that are already available, um, fully virtualized, you can run them in Power 9. So, so this is going to mean that you're running the VIO server, right, that's uh, in the, the Power 9 version of the VIO server. And so it's really using, it's doing all the um, I.O. Uh, on the system direct to the I.O. And um, so these these versions of AIX are available to make use of that through the VIO server and still run, right? But the, they run in their, in their various compatibility modes. There are some changes um, to AIX that are coming uh, in 7.2 to uh, activate or make use of these features. So you'll see uh, TL2 and TL3 changes that are coming in, um, in AIX. I just wanted to throw this up here so that, that you know that they're coming. Um, that if you're running AI 7.2, um, which I hope you are, that you can then um, get the latest TL levels, that you can make use of, of these features 
depending on your workload, it might make a big difference um, or, or not as much difference. So um, Linux support next. So Linux is really designed to function in multiple modes. Um, you can run Linux in bare metal KVM or PowerVM, um, different modes. Um, for the, uh, these systems, the S922, the 924, um, will only support PowerVM, all right? Uh, they do not support bare metal or KVM. Uh, if you remember in Power 8, you could change the system with to go to Opal or something like that. Uh, we're not doing that with these systems. And also for now, even the Linux only system, the L922 is a Power VM only, all right? So you can run Linux. Um, all of the Linux today on Power 9 will run under P um, with Power VM. Here's the different Linux um, supported features. Uh, Ubuntu is all um, Power 8 compatibility mode. All of the Ubuntu 16s will always be P8 compatibility mode. Uh, I understand that a new version is coming out soon. Uh, I want to say it's 18, but I'm not positive on that. Um, but that will be in Power 9 mode. Um, SUSE has a SLES 11 is Power 8 compatibility mode. Um, 12 will run in the basic Power 9 mode. So here's the only SUSE, the only Linux that's running in um, Power 9 mode. And then uh, We've got um, Red Hat, and Red Hat Big Indian is not going to be supported at all on Power 9. Uh, we're only supporting, uh, Red Hat is only supporting Little Indian in Power 8 compatibility mode on, on Power 9 systems. All right, and then um, CentOS, not officially tested or supported by IBM. Um, I'm told that it probably will work just fine. Uh, it's compatib P8 compatibility mode. Um, but it probably will work this fine, but we have not tested it. Um, HANA. So HANA is, um, of course, uses different to either SUSE or Red Hat version of Linux for HANA. And these are the, uh, and it says non-production support because HANA has not yet certified the Linux for Power 9. Um, I understand that's coming um, pretty quickly. Um, so they're, they're, they're on it. Um, I don't know when it's going to be done. Probably need to, probably need to ask um, SAP when it's going to be done and not IBM because SAP is, is the one that's doing it. So um, Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux uh, will be for, in Power 8 mode, as I said. The SUSE, the SLES 12, will run in Power 9, the base mode. Um, I would go ahead and you could test with both of those and use both of those. Um, and with the Power 9, and then we're just waiting for the um, SAP to actually certify them. Oh, let's see. All right. Um, IBM I. So, uh, Mickey, are you there? I'm here, Joe. All right. Why don't you, I want you to take over for the next few slides here and talk about the IBM I. Okay, on the IBM I slide, these are the uh, operating system levels that are going to be supported with Power 9. It'd be 7.2 and 7.3. Uh, the TR levels are TR8 for 7.2 and TR4 for 7.3. Those are tech refreshes. Uh, those were just announced on the 13th of February, and uh, they'll be available on the 16th of March. So you won't see any 7.1 here um, that's going out of support on April 30th. So if you're still on 7.1, please get to 7.2 or 7.3 because we don't need all the extra money that you'll have to be paying us for support. Um, go on to the next chart, Joe. Um, one of the things that uh, you notice is we don't have a DVD player in Power 9. So when we're trying to do a demo at IPL, we need a way to get booted up. And now they're going to enable that with the USB adapter that's in the Power 9 system unit. So you can use any type of USB attached hardware, the DVD, RDX, or USB flash drive, as long as they're attached to that USB adapter. And to get the install media, that was one of the questions earlier, um, there will be .IMG and .UDF files available 
on the entitled software support website. So that's something new for the IBMI world. Uh, go to the next chart, Joe. Uh, this is the IBMI roadmap. Um, as you can see, we go back 7 1, came out in 2010, and that's almost eight years of being supported, so it's good it's going away. 7 2 was in 2014, 7 3 followed soon after that. Um, I remember we had said that there was going to be a longer gap between releases, but there was way too many things that they wanted to get into. The data, database, especially with 7.3, so they came out with it earlier. And like we said, 7.3 TR4 and TR and 7.2 TR8 are what's going to be required to run a Power9 server. Next chart, Joe. Hey, Joe, anything you to say on this one? Which one's this one? <laughs> okay, now we're at, at a, it's a little bit delayed up here. Sorry about that. Um, this is okay. just a, uh, another support roadmap. Um, there's no end of support been announced for 7.2 and 7.3, but if you go through history, you can probably figure out how long it's going to last. Um, and like I've just said, 7.1, regular support is going away. Um, the extended support is going to be available for three years, but that's pretty expensive. So get to 7.2 and 7.3. That's about all I got on the IBMI side, Joe. Okay, thanks, Mickey. Um, a few words about uh, uh, HMCs. Uh, so the, the HMCs that support Power9, uh, this is the list of them. This is a, the simple list. Uh, you have to run HMC code level um, BR. B9R1.910. Um, so the, you can see the, the CR7, CR8, and CR9 no longer being sold. CR1 is our latest. Uh, CR1 is the HMC that runs on uh, power. Uh, the, the other option you have, of course, is the virtual HMC uh, that will also support um, power nine uh, with this particular uh, HMC code level. So you can run virtual HMC uh, as well. Um, so this is the ones. Uh, so the, the Power 8, just a little bit, we, we talked about the HMC uh, on the VUG last year. Um, we, we did some HMC announcements last year. Um, that's when we announced the CR1, which is the Power 8 model. Um, and uh, very fast and, and great. Uh, Notice that, that it will not support it itself. I mean, it's a Power 8, but it, you can't manage yourself. Um, as much as I tell my manager, that I, he says, Joe, you can't manage yourself. That's why you need, I need him. So uh, you can use that. As I mentioned, you can also use the Power 8 virtual HMC. It runs as a VML power on Power 8. You can use that. There's a, also a um, an Intel version. All right. Um, it's not KVM, Zen, or VMware. Those are all Intel. So you can. Um, bottom line, really, it's it's the same HMC strategy as we've had before. You need at least one. Um, you should have uh, recommend at least two. Um, really should have two. Um, we have no uh, IBM support on these systems, so you can't use uh, the old IBM uh, on these. So here's the HMC releases. Uh, so 870, you know, if you're doing Power 8 uh, and what they supported, so this would manage Power 6, 7, or 8. Notice um, the 9 version, when you go to HMC version 9 to support Power 9, we lose support for Power 6. If you have Power 6 server, um, boy, that's getting pretty old. You really ought to probably upgrade that. I can't imagine what maintenance you're paying on that. Probably buy a new Power 9 just off the maintenance you're paying on the Power 6. So um, just know that when you update your HMC, uh, if you're using it, uh, you know, an older HMC that, and you're doing this and you update it, you're going to not be able to manage Power 6 with it. So don't be surprised, please. All right. Um, also, when you go to um, the new versions of the HMC, we, uh, it's the enhanced plus GUI only, and no longer have the classic GUI. Um, and uh, I, I've heard um, uh, from people that the enhanced plus GUI is, is really great now. It made super, uh, uh, super um, I don't want to say enhancements, but it's enhanced GUI. <laughs> 
but, but we we've really fixed it up well. It's it's doing good. It's got great performance. Um, and and actually, I heard Nigel say that that he wouldn't even go back to the classic. That he really likes the the enhanced GUI. So um, there you got that. Right. So if you're if you're gonna buy Power Nine, um, maybe get a CR1 and get a Power Eight HMC with it. Um, I have a couple of miscellaneous things. I wasn't sure where to really throw these, um, but I, I wanted to put them in here. So I have a few more charts to go through, um, and then we can we can get around and, and make sure that we get all the questions answered. First of all, we got a Power VM offer. This is kind of cool. I've never seen this before. If you're buying uh, a, a brand new Power Nine and you want to migrate, we're going to make it easy. You live partition mobility, but gosh, you don't have. And so the Power Nine systems come with Power VM. Um, I should have said this earlier. They come with Power VM. They come with Power VM um, enhanced, so you can use live partition mobility on them. It's built into the system. We cannot take it off. Um, you can, if you're really not going to use it at all, you can take off um, the SWAMA. All right, so you don't have to pay for SWAMA. Uh, lots of talk amongst us IBMers. Oh yeah, we want to do this. How do we do it? And everything. So we can take off the SWAMA, but it will come with Power VM. Um, uh, so that you can do LTM, all right? So um, how do you do it if your old systems don't have Power VM? Well, IBM is offering, when you buy your Power9, you use this feature code, one for each old server that you have, and you will get a temporary 60-day Power VM license for your Power7 or Power8 system so that you can use it to LPM your workloads. Now, how cool is that, all right? So, and then I think it's a, a no charge um, feature, so you're not even being charged for that temporary license, to make it easier, make your life easier. Um, another little uh, thing, uh, we didn't really talk about um, upgrades, so we don't have any same serial upgrades. We don't do that usually. We've never done that that I think of for our scale out models. Um, so let's talk about what can be moved. Um, CPU, no, you cannot move the CPU from Power 8 to Power 9. Motherboard, nope, totally different. Memory, notice, remember that we went from our buffered memory in Power 8, all systems had buffery, to industry standard DIMMs in Power 9, so memory cannot move from Power 8 or, or older systems to Power 9, and neither can the power supplies. So what can you move? You can move some of the adapters, so we have some adapters, G, um, PCI Gen 3 and Gen 4 definitely um, can move, all right? Um, you'd have to look in the adapter um, pages that I showed earlier and get a, a feel for whether um, those go in there or not. So you can move those, and, and um, of course, they have to be the same form factor. And then some of the disks. All the disks in Power9 um, are the 4K, that's small form factor 3 only. So if you're going to move disks, <coughs> they have to be that. And I think I mentioned that the one IO drawers, IO drawers can move, um, you know, PCI expansion drawers and stuff, those, those can move as well. If they're if they're the supported models, a couple of things about the um, power supplies. Um, in Power Eight, we used a 900 watt power supply. Um, in Power Nine, that's a 1400 watt power supply. So um, much beefier. Um, and a little chart here to show you. If you want redundancy, we have redundancy support supports up to four, and then 924 power supplies. In two plus two, you can run. Um, then on on uh, two power supplies, you can. Then uh, support, so you have redundancy in power supplies. Same with the 914 and the 912. The tower version also has um, four power supplies that can also, you have an option in the tower version, as I mentioned, to do um, uh, 110 voltage, all right? So you have a lower voltage. The rest of them are all 200 um, voltage power supplies. And then just a little bit about the power supplies here um, that, uh, to make them you know, EPA Energy Star compliant and, and low heat so that we can cool this easier and all of that. Um, a couple of announcement links. You might find this uh, useful. You could take uh, uh, use these links and go read more about each of these systems. Um, the, these are the announcement letters, and, the, and that's they're always kind of nice to read, uh, the announcement letters, and, and hopefully uh, I told you all the important stuff, but there might be some stuff in there um, that, that I didn't cover. Um, also, some video links. <laughs> if you want to learn more about Power9, the chip, you can go all the way back to um, the uh, what, uh, virtual user group one. We did January of 2017. 
uh, where we had Jeff Stukely, uh, Guru, and Power9, and, and uh, he did a great job of talking about Power9. Um, you can go to uh, the um, December version, uh, just December of 2017, and get the uh, Power9, the AC922, and, and learn about that. Um, also, Nigel has some great, oops, Nigel has some great videos. Um, you should go watch. Um, I think he unboxes a brand new Power 9, what the one they got. He goes through setup and stuff and way cool. Um, that's where I got some of the photos that I showed there from. Um, actually, if you go on and look at um, Nigel's whole video outlook, he's covered lots of things there. And then we have um, some strategic outlook stuff that Bill Starkey did. Um, and then uh, Wikipedia on Power 9. Um, probably get all the other stuff from there. I'm not sure how much new stuff Wikipedia would have. So um, that's all I have. Uh, why don't we go ahead and, and as, as we can do some questions. Uh, I know that we've had um, Nigel, Tom, and, and Mickey answering questions in the background. So uh, guys, you, if you want to chime in and let me know if there's questions that we haven't gotten to. I'd say there's about 50 questions about getting a copy of the slide deck <laughs> that we haven't answered. <laughs> Okay, well, the, the slide deck is on the wiki, all right, and uh, the the wiki, um, shoot, all the all the emails that you get from me have the wiki in it. I, I can I can uh, put out what the actual site is uh, if we need to on here. Why don't I just uh, type this in here? This is the short version. It's a it's a bitly. Um, a bitly version. So um uh so the uh, the so the, the presentation is out there. Uh when I'm when I'm done here and I get the replay all uploaded and everything like that, I'll put a link out on the wiki as well to the replay for this. If you actually go to the wiki you can you can see all the past um webinars that we've done for the last many years and get uh, presentation materials and and uh, um, links to videos, replays from there as well. Hey, John, um, i here. Yeah. So there was a, the, the new things always bring the most interesting questions. So in these systems, there's this new concept of, you know, multiple different clock speeds that you might see based upon how cool your data center is and, and how much power is coming into the system and uh, et cetera, and, and, and the different settings and the ASMI menus and all that sort of stuff. So there's quite a bit of confusion about that. Even questions like, how do I know what speed it's running at? Is there a way of monitoring that? And then the other one, the other area of questioning uh, uh, to tee another one up is, this whole aspect of these NVMe internal drive slots, et cetera. So lots of questions around, you know, how do I use those? Can I split mirror across them? How many LPARs can I boot, et cetera, et cetera. So two areas. Yeah, so let, let, me, yeah, so let me say a couple of things. First about, um, uh, about the power. There are tools um, that you can use to um, monitor the actual frequency as it's running. Um, I want to say, I see I had it in my notes here. Let me see if I can get back to there. Um, I just don't want to say it and not be right here. I do that often enough as it is. Um, let's see. So the ones that I had listed were LP, oh, come on. Oh, thought I had it in there. Um, I thought it was something like L, L, um, LPM stat. Um, there's a Linux one. Um, Nigel, does, does Enmon show the, the uh, dynamic frequency? 
<laughs> Very good question. <laughs> gonna, oh. have to give, gonna have to give it a test. Have a look. The L pass okay. stat command gives you a um, NC, NSP, a nominal speed value. So if it shows you a percentage of 115%, then you're 15% overclocked. Oh, okay. Okay. So there were, I, I did see on a chart, there were a couple of um, things. I think I got them from Todd Rosedahl or, or, um, or Ron Arroyo. I can't remember which, but I, I got things and it would show you, there were a couple of commands that were supposed to show you that. I think maybe that one was, that LPAR stat was one of them. Um, I'll try and I'll try and get those and, and post those somewhere as well, but but really it's it's not something one that I mean, unless you unless you want to know for some reason um, it's it's not something you necessarily have to worry about. Um, the, the, the real thing to think about is is it okay to use um, extra power um, and and make more noise with faster fans to get. Um, better performance to get more more performance out of your system, and if that's okay, then you want to go to that um, maximum performance mode. If not, then it, it's just best to run in the in the dynamic performance mode, unless you're trying to just save a um, lot of a lot of energy and you know you don't really have much workload, and and then you can go down to um, a power saver mode. Um, but uh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really, you know, we've, we've had this dynamic. It's, it's usually dynamic anyway, um, unless you, unless you set it and, and want it static so that you know that everything always happens exactly the same. Um, it's usually pretty dynamic anyway, because we, we will, and we've adjusted our frequency based on the, uh, thermals and the before. Um, and so it, it shouldn't, I don't know, it shouldn't be a concern that you actually have to know. Although I, I get it. Some people are just, um, uh, like, like me. A little geeky, and they want to they want to know what everything's running at and, and have tight control on it. So, uh, if you're going to do this, you can't you don't have the tight control. Um, the, the other thing that you mentioned, Tom, what, uh, what was the second one? Uh, the the internal NVMe uh, disk uh, card yes. slots were booting. Yeah, so I talked to Tracy Smith about this, and and he actually suggested that that we do a. a virtual user group session on this because he has uh, some things to, to talk about um, as far as you know the best way to use this so I, I remember I mentioned that you can uh, you can um, split these up at every drive so every each slot every carrier has two drives on it so there's four drives total that, that you can have and every drive can be given to a to an LPAR so you, you could give this this NVMe to a particular LPAR if you wanted um, and and then it could use it uh, if you give it to the VIO server then the VIO server can can virtualize it just like if, if it had a disk, all right? So it's, it's just like a disk in that in that sense. Mirroring is a little bit different because it's not like a, a SAS adapter there um, where you can do this mirroring um, between it. So you don't have this like SAS adapter that's got six cards that's gonna mirror. Um, and I and I talked to, with, with Tracy about this and he said, yeah, I, technically I suppose you could mirror this. It would have to be through the operating system would have to do it because the card isn't going to do it on itself, so you'd have to like mirror it through the operating system, and you could mirror. You know, you're not going to get RAID or anything, but you could like you know mirror between two of these if you wanted to. Um, so that is possible, um, but you, but it's done a little bit different up at, at the OS. Um, that way, it's not like a RAID type thing. Um, but I'll tell you what, um, Tracy is actually is is eager to do this, and I don't think it's a whole 90 minute session. We might combine it with something else. Um, but um, I'll kind of put it on the, on the top of my list that we put a, an NVMe kind of a, a bug session out here and, and do one uh, fairly soon. Yeah, Tom here again, if, if I could chime in. The, with the Power 8 and now again with the Power 9s, we, we have a, a plethora of, it's not just a disk drive in a system options, you know, SSDs, NVMe flashcards, and now NVMA internal card slots, and there's a variety of different use cases that you you might want to look at for those. Um, either thing from you know caching speed up for I/O um, to uh, I'll call it onboard database, you know, database in the system versus database on the SAN, and or parts of database there, uh, or some of these you know um, things like uh, Hadoop and other sort of data lake things that are more traditionally done 
storage in the server versus storage on a SAN. So there's a lot of different use cases. And, and I think uh, a session that incorporates that as well as just the characteristics of the NVMe card adapters would be useful. Yes. All right. Other questions here. Oh, okay. So Ralph gives a Ralph gives a little way to do uh to look at the frequency. I'll put that out there. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. There are Power Nine Red Books out there. I've seen a couple of draft ones. Um, not sure that there's any that aren't draft yet. There's definitely one on the AC922, but I'm not sure about the scale out yet. It's only been announced a week ago. Yeah, right. It's probably a team that's sitting out there in Austin doing it at the moment. Um, as far as the HANA, I, I did see one question. I want to make clear. I mean, the HANA versions don't come with HANA. Uh, HANA versions, they don't, the, the, the H versions don't come with HANA. It's not included with them. Um, they're just, we've had the solution additions before with, we had them um, for Power 8 for HANA. We've had solution additions for, for various things. Um, the solution addition really usually just means that it is priced differently because we're breaking into that market or in the case of the L models, um, because they don't have to support AIX and IBMI, so we lower the price for them to be more competitive that way. Um, the HANA solution additions or the HANA additions for these Power9 models just mean that they are um, not Linux only, but they're limited to only 25% of the AIX and IBM I, um, but that they are really meant for HANA system, for, for the HANA workload and probably will be um, priced differently. So when and everything is list price, um, it's kind of like buying a car. I don't know anybody that buys, pays list price. Um, so the discounts on the HANA systems, I expect, will probably be um, uh, a little better than you would on the other systems. Especially if you build, if you buy a, a million bucks worth at a time. Exactly. Uh, the uh, the RDX, you know, I, I questioned when we when we went to RDX, um, putting an RDX instead of a DVD um, in there. Well, why are we why are we replacing DVDs with RDX? And and uh, RDX is is really a drive type thing and I was told that um, we're not really replacing DVD with RDX, replacing tape with RDX. Um, the DVD is just getting old, really going to USB for DV DVD and the, and the RDX is really a replacement for the tape. Um, maybe that was um, uh, obvious to everybody else, but I, I had to question it um, when I first looked at what, what we were doing on these systems. In the past, we've got questions about is IBM supplying the USB memory keys, and the answer is no. <laughs> and if we did, we'd charge you two hundred dollars for a little one. So um, you don't really want to buy an IBM one. Everybody has their favourite manufacturer that they've found that proved reliable, and uh, we can discuss that over a beer sometime. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that if you if you want, that there is a way to order one from IBM. Uh, but you're, Nigel's absolutely right; it, it's going to be two hundred dollars <laughs> for for a thirty dollar USB stick. So, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah go, go go get one that that you like. Um, run down to your favorite uh, electronics store. Order it online, whatever. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why they didn't put 12 cores um, in the um, AX IBMI versions of the, you know, the S922 um, or 24 cores in the S922. Um, H922. Uh, why we only have it in the Linux? Uh, I'm not sure. There's a, a reason there. Um, and there must be something. Well, one could speculate that the uh, projects like Coral have bought 10,000 chips. I mean that uh, the top end chips are uh, not in abundant supply at the moment. So um, we're encouraging people to use the. Uh, the less number of cores, as you still get a performance jump even with the uh, less cores. That's a that's a, a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So Brett says it's the same with it was the same with the S eight twenty two and this. Um, 822L, so the same thing with that. Okay. Will the CR9 work with version 9 version of HMC? Yes, um, a CR9, a 7042 CR9 will support the version 9 um, HMC code. So the, the CR9 is uh, will, can be used to manage Power9 systems. Yep, CR7 and CR8 can do as well, but make sure you got some spare memory in there rather than the original small sizes. Exactly. Uh, we don't know um, what the Oracle license factor will do for Power9. And I, I, that's a point that I didn't really talk about is that, um, you know, I said uh, Power9s are all being shipped with the um, Power VM Enterprise Edition so that you could do LPM. Um, my understanding is uh, Oracle has an issue with, with uh, LPM and Oracle, and uh, they don't they don't even want people to have the ability to uh, move the Oracle things around, uh, Oracle workloads around, unless they're buying licenses everywhere at 40k a pop per core. So um, so what people have done is they they cannot put Power VM Enterprise Edition on some systems. So since we're shipping this with Power VM. Standard and and we can't take power VM off the system. There's just no way for us to deconfigure that um, There is an option and um, I'll have to post it. I, I thought I had the, I thought I had it in the chart here But um, I must not have there is an option a, a way to deconfigure um, Live partition mobility that will satisfy Oracle on these systems So if, if you have in that issue um, send me a note um, and I'll I'll get you how to do that, but there is a there is a way to do that so that you can run Oracle and the Power Nine and not have to deal with um, the licensing issue that they have with live partition mobility. I think you buy an ME uh, free MES upgrade to do that. Is the process you use to do that? And to satisfy Oracle, it's a one-way path. <laughs> yes. You can't switch it on and off after you've done it. Also, the the, um, the Power Nines we just have with the two sockets, we just have two chips. So um, Oracle prices go down if it's just a two socket server with two chips in it. With the Power Eight, we actually had four chips in the two sockets. They were dual chip modules, and so um, you should be able to get a lower license from uh, Oracle. That's the uh, fingers crossed what we're hoping for. As they they offer a two socket uh, lower price that we can now uh, go for. Uh. 
Oh, let's see. Other questions? I think we yeah, answered the X86. Go on. Yeah, so the, the, the X86 version of the, the virtual HMC, um, will that support um, the version 9 code? Um, my understanding is it will. Nigel, is that not right? Can you, do you That's know right, that? yeah. If you built okay, the virtual HMC, you can upgrade to the latest release. Somebody confirmed that further down the, the list. I think we answered quite a lot of the, a lot of the questions. But then people have to go and read them to find them. So we got some questions up here in twice, and we said we answered that ten minutes ago. And uh, I made a joke about good grief. You're talking about old kit here. Um, you'll be asking about floppy disk nest. So then I got three or four questions about floppy disk support. <laughs> I saw that. I was wondering what prompted that. <laughs> that was me. All right, all right. Well, I guess we're we're pretty much through it. So um, I want to say uh, thank you to to um, everybody. I want to. Uh, especially to uh, Nigel, Tom, and Mickey for uh, helping me out here. I, I knew there'd be a lot of questions and there was no way I was gonna be able to get through the pitch plus um, be able to answer all the questions in the back. So thank you very much, guys. You, you made this worthwhile. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, I hope you can run out and buy a Power9 system now. Um, and uh, remember, you can get the charts and, and I'll put the replay up on the wiki. And next month, um, as I mentioned, we'll be we'll be having a webinar early, March 15th. We're going to move it up a bit. So, with that, uh, everybody have a great day. Um, thanks very much.